Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. I'd like to welcome you to our roundtable discussion. And uh, I have to have a few thank yous here. This presentation is being recorded by Missoula Community Access Television as part of a media assistance grant donated by AMCAT. For your information, visit MCAT.org. And we'd like to uh, thank our friends of Two Rivers for sponsoring the Bonner Milltown History Center and Museum for this grant and to MCAT for providing this important gift to preserve our timber heritage history. Thanks also to St. Anne's Catholic Church for allowing us to have this facility. Uh, thanks to Joe Brown and Walter Peckham, sound technicians over here. And uh, as you can see, we got coffee and cookies over here, so you can help yourself at any time. Now, the uh, restrooms are back here in the corner to the right. So, uh, after the program, you're invited to have a pasty supper that St. Anne's is putting on. And they are delicious. I know because I get them every year. <laughs> yep, <amen. laughs> yeah. And uh, me being Swedish, I was asked to say something in Swedish. And I am going to do something that my father taught me years ago. And uh, you might recognize the tune. Triggar i kaningen vara, den skus lilla borna skora. Shrenen ej på himla fästet, fågel nej i kände nästet. I Jesus vi behöva, du kära borna vän. Jag vill i mer bedreva, till signa dig igen. And, <laughs> I have, uh, we had, I should say, we had three that were going to be on this program. And Don, or Dan Taylor, which was the pastor for Hope Baptist, well, he was invited, but he canceled out because he had a family emergency. And uh, we have Kim Briggerman over here. And uh, he grew up in, at, in the St. Anne's Catholic Parish after his family moved to the area in 1958. He started his career as an altar boy in second grade near the end of the Latin mass area, and he and a couple of buddies began serving as lectors in Hurley High School. Kim and Linda were married to St. Anne in St. Anne in 1983. Three daughters and both granddaughters have been baptized in the church. Kim is currently a member of the parish council and we have Carl Rohr over here, who was born and raised in Cleveland, which is close to Lakewood and Westlake, Ohio, before attending Capitol University in what is now Trinity Lutheran Cemetery in Bexley, Ohio. His internship first brought him to Townsend, Montana. Upon completion of seminary, he served parishes in Weibo, Hamilton, Post Falls, Idaho, Billings, and Bonner. He was a pastor of Our Savior's Lutheran Church in Bonner 
from 92 to 2006. He is the father of four children, Scott in St. Paul, Steve in Hollywood, Jennifer in Minneapolis, Gretchen in Washington, D.C. Carl and his husband, John Winchell, now live in Ronan. Oh, I forgot one thing. Next month, March 19th, the uh, Dennis Sane is going to be entertaining us with a discussion of the logging camps, which included the headquarters camp in Woodworth, Montana. And that is here at 2 p.m. And I will leave this now with Kim Briggerman. Thank you, Rick, and thanks everybody for coming out on this sunny day <laughs> to come inside and listen to this um, I appreciate the the turnout we had hoped um, to include the hoped at Baptist uh, in this as the third standing church in Bonner and and Dan Taylor was at our planning meeting but he was called out of town um, the the beauty of that would have been we, we were thinking because our two churches the Lutheran and Catholic churches were started in the first decade of the 1990 or the 1900s and Hope Baptist was built in 1996 so in the last decade of the century it would have been a, a good uh, compare and contrast on how the community has changed because really I want to make this or we want to make this um, Bonner's story through through our church history so that said um, if there is are people that can lend their own stories um, from the Hope Baptist perspective here today. We sure hope you, you chime in. Because we're going to turn it over to all of you at, at different points in this um, presentation. And I tried to write on the board over there to give you an idea of what our subjects would, were going to be um, after we get done with our uh, creation stories, as we're calling them. So. Um, my job right now, though, is to kind of set the scene when um, these the two churches were built. Um, St. Anne, the first St. Anne Church was built in 1905. The first um, Our Savior Lutheran was built in 1910. And so we're talking a whole different uh, century. And um, what was going on in Bonner at that time? Well, one of the, in 1905, one of the, I guess, landmark events, they started building the dam in 1905. And in 1910, um, the streetcar arrived in Bonner from Missoula, the electric streetcar. And of course, those two events are, are closely associated because Senator William A. Clark was the, was the financier and uh, the, the developer of both events and of course the the power that the dam generated was what ran the streetcar system and most other things in Missoula can you hear me yeah. okay um, so what was going on culture wise in the in the early 1900s um, well in 1908, Emil Zog's trophy goat shot on Sheep Mountain received a prize at the St. Louis World's Fair. It was stuffed and sent to the fair by Dr. Coiningham, Cunningham, who was practicing in Bonner. He shows up in a lot of uh, Bonner history uh, stories. The early automobiles were essentially motorized buggies and they were reaching Montana during this time when our churches were beginning. Ford Motor Company was established just a couple years before this church was built in 1903, but it was Oldsmobile, the one-cylinder, three-horsepower, tiller-steered, curb-dash automobiles were the big sellers. <laughs> and we started out here with a an old scratchy rendition of by the Den Denver Nightingale called Billy Murray. 
he had the number three song in 1905, and it was in my Mary Oldsmobile. So that's why we started out with that thing. Um, of course, the pop music, no iPods, no radio, no television. How did they, how did we and Bonner get our music back then? Well, in some cases it started in vaudeville. It was passed into the popular, the mass uh, culture by bands and orchestras. And so whether, whether we were singing back then or not here in Bonner, I don't know. <laughs> I don't have any recordings from that. So in our minds, let's step outside the door here. In 19, if it's 1905, and you look to your right, you're going to see, in the, off in the distance, you're going to see the lumber mill that was built and started producing in 1886, way down there. Um, but closer, you're going to see um, what was called the Bonner House. The Bonner House was a stage station, a bar, a hotel. Um, I think it was two or three stories high. It was where Kelly Pine Baseball Field is right now, on the other side of the pine trees. So that's what you'd see first, first and foremost if you looked to your right in 1905. If you look to your left, there's the Northern Pacific Station across, mm -hmm. across the way. And straight out in front of here, like there is today, was the county road. From, from Missoula and to everywhere else. There was no junction right here, as I understand it. Um, the county road in the early days um, ran and forked right about midway when you're, when you're passing Bonner School. The, the, the road kind of turned towards the mountain and uh, right where the breezeway is basically and the new cafeteria in Bonner School. And then it, it would have forked um, part of it going on up to, to Bonner uh, when he got, got near where the railroad tracks are now and then kept on going up the Clark Fork to Butte and Boston or wherever um, and the other, <laughs> the other forest. So let's, now it's 1910 and we step outside the door and it's a different, vis different view. Closest right in front of us almost is the new school. 1907, they built the two, uh, two-story wooden schoolhouse, um, sort of where the, the the Bonner School is right now. But even I think it was a little closer, if I remember right. There's many of you here that probably went to that school. It was closed down, I think, in 1957, uh, and torn down after after the new school was built. Before 1907, Bonner had a school, but it was at the end of Bonner. Um, it was in the second floor of Masonic Hall. Yes? That school was raised in 1956. 19 I graduated from it in 55. Okay, the, the wooden, the two story w that was right here was raised in 56. Okay. Um, the reason that they moved the school, they built a new school here uh, at, rather than at the end of Bonner, obviously things were, things were hopping. Milltown was just getting started in 1903, 1904, I think is when it, when it was laid out by William Clark. And um, so the population, the mill was, mill was growing and town was growing. They, there was some pushback of the uh, mill workers' kids that had to go all the way to the end of Bonner to go to school. And so this was kind of a compromised location, as I understand. Yet, like like the, um, the churches were built on land given to them by, by the mill, the big Blackfoot Milling Company, which turned into Anaconda. Um, so 1910, we're looking out the front window here, or front door, and you got, you got the, uh, the school to your right, and to your left, of course, you have the, the, the new Lutheran Church which is basically, I think, where, where, the old, where the current one is on that location. So, um, and Carl will fill you in on that as we go along here in a minute. Um, those, these two churches stood side by side then, 
ever since. For, so for the last 107 years, and uh, we'll be able to get into not only our individual um, histories a little bit and memories, but, but when we intermingled, which happens more often than, than you probably think, or maybe not. But. So sit back and listen. Um, we're going to now uh, start off with our creation stories um, that date back to 1905-1910, and uh, I'm going to turn it over to Carl. When I look around the room, I'm thinking some of you should be up here instead of me, because I, I know you know a lot more history than I do. Uh, I was thinking on the way down from Ronan that uh, I arrived in Bonner, it will be almost 25 years ago. It'll be 25 years ago in June, which seems like a long time and seems like yesterday at the same time. But that's just a minor portion of the history that we're talking about today. So we, we both invite you to, to join in the conversation whenever you want to. Uh, after each one of our segments, we'll open it up to you. And, and if you have uh, memories, stories, and corrections that you want to make, uh, we're happy to have you voice them. So please keep that in mind. Uh, the history of Lutheranism in the United States is much like the history of, of the country itself. Uh, the nation is a nation of a lot of immigrants. Lutherans came from other places, uh, predominantly from Germany and from the Scandinavian countries. But if uh, those groups had probably not come, uh, one wonders what the Lutheran Church would be today. Uh, they settled in many different areas, and each little group, when they would settle in a particular area, would form a church, because the church was to be a part of their community. So you had all of these Lutheran churches, rather small ones, serving the needs of uh, the individual groups where they had settled. Uh, you might have them very close to each other, because this group spoke only Finn, and this group spoke only Norwegian, and this group spoke only Sweden, Swedish, so how could they worship together? So the church has not only been an immigrant church, but it also has been a church of merging. Because when English became used more and more and became the predominant language in the country, then these churches started to ask, well, why are we here speaking our English and you're five miles down the road and you're speaking English? We can understand each other. Why don't we come together? And so not just the language, but the customs started adapting to this new country and churches came together. So the whole history of the Lutheran Church has been a history of coming together and a history of merging. Uh, there's only one exception to that, and that's the Lutheran Church Missouri Synod. Uh, they were formed in 1847 uh, by Saxon and German immigrants, and that church pretty much stayed the same with its headquarters uh, in Missouri. Uh, they were called the German Evangelical Lutheran Synod of Missouri, Ohio, and other states to begin with. And then on their 100th anniversary in 1947, they changed their name to Lutheran Church Missouri Synod. But other Lutherans have, little by little, have been coming together through the years. I think about that when I think about Bonner and about those early years in, in Bonner, because there were certainly all of these different ethnic and nationality groups present in this area. Uh, I learned that very early on when I came to Bonner. We had a group of, of Swedes and a group of Norwegians and a group of Finns and, and so forth and so on. And they, initially they weren't always terribly friendly towards each other. Uh, but little by little it started to happen. Initially, uh, in the early days of Our Savior's Lutheran Church, there had been a Swedish community church 
that had been built on the west end of the old Black Bridge in, in West Riverside in the very early 1900s. And the Swedes centered their worship life around that place. Uh, when the Reverend H. O. Svari came to Missoula in 1904 to organize St. Paul Lutheran Church, uh, the, Luther the Norwegians here in Bonner thought, oh, we ought to get in on that, and wouldn't it be nice to have our own church out here in Bonner? So they began to uh, inquire and to uh, form in their minds and ultimately uh, in their community the, uh, the dream of having a Norwegian Lutheran church here in Bonner. Uh, the Finns were also well represented in this area. Uh, people still talk of Finn town, and uh, the Finns in, and in the year, what year was it? In 1915, the Finns comprised two thirds of the population of Milltown. So it was a very Finnish town, and they had Finn Hall, and they had church services that were held uh, in Finn Hall, and other things as well. Uh, with all these Scandinavian groups settling in this area, the Lutheran Church began to take off. And with the Reverend E.B. Oswald leading worship in 1906, and the congregation was then organized in 1908. The worship services were held in Norwegian, uh, and that went on for quite a while. Actually, it wasn't until 1935 when Norwegian was no longer used as the worship language of that group. Uh, I understand it kind of they kind of weaned themselves. Uh, they started by one Sunday in English and then two Sundays, and but in 1935 they took away that one Sunday a month that they were using Norwegian and from then on everything was held in English. Uh, the Ladies Aid organized in 1907. And those of us who know anything about church know that when the ladies get going, things begin to happen. Um, <laughs> early on in my ministry, I found out that's where the money is. <laughs> and that's where the passion is. And that's where the activity is. And the ladies' aid really got going strong in this area amongst the Lutherans. And they began to, uh, they began to make things happen. I'll talk a little more about it when I talk about our church buildings in a few <coughs> minutes. Uh, soon a f Sunday school was formed. And the Sunday school at the, the Our Savior's Lutheran Church uh, really skyrocketed during the years. And I, I remember reading uh, several times about when they had 124 students in their Sunday school. And they think, oh, by today's standards, that's really quite amazing. Uh, but the Sunday school was organized. And in 1909, the congregation decided to build that it was time to build on land that was provided to them by the Anaconda um, Copper Mining Company. And the building was dedicated in October of 1910. Uh, the first resident pastor, they were often served out of Missoula in connection with St. Paul. And the first resident pastor arrived in August of 1949, Bernard Updahl. Uh, he then was followed by C.O. Anderson, whose son Lowell would later marry Donna, the daughter of uh, Melvin and Clara Madsen. Mm -hmm. And the pastor since then, and I'm going to just mention them because they're recent enough that some of us remember their names and so forth. Uh, then was Herb Knutson, who died, what, two years ago or three years ago in Missoula. Dick Wiederhold, he and his wife Patsy still live up in, uh, just out of Polson. Uh, Rod Kwame, who died this past year. Uh, then me, and then Cindy Pippinich from Bozeman served an interim, uh, followed by Gene Larson, and currently the Eric Youseth is the pastor of the congregation. Uh, by my calculations, he's the 26th pastor of uh, the congregation. 
I think I'm going to stop there because I'm going to do a little more on buildings in a few minutes, but stories that you think of, corrections, comments, we want to do it while it's fresh, yes. When you mentioned 120 kids in Sunday school, in my mind, that represented just 10 families back then. Well, <laughs> <laughs> you're right, you're right. Ask them to identify themselves. Oh, yes. Please, identify yourself, please. <laughs> Jim Hobbick. And... You are representing from what congregation? Uh, First Presbyterian Church in Missoula, Montana, Great. <laughs> dating back to 1867. You got to jump on us out here. <laughs> yeah, please identify yourself when you speak. Um, Sue Iverson, and I'm from Our Saviors. Bob Peterson was after oh, did I mention? Dick Wiederholt. Yes, I skipped. It's written here. I skipped. And Bob Peterson is currently in Idaho. Boise. Boise. Mm -hmm. I'm sorry about that. Thank you. Anyone else? Okay. I'm Lowell Anderson. I'm a retired pastor uh, of the Lutheran denomination. Uh, my dad was uh, Reverend C. O. Anderson, who came to Our Saviors in 1953, I believe, December of 1953 right. until uh, January of 62. Uh, one of my memories, and this goes back to about, oh, I'd say 1956, 1957, was a father major. How many of you knew Father Major? Have you ever seen him in his black garb, white clergy collar, covered with sawdust? <laughs> okay. <laughs> Pardon? It was ashes from his cigarettes. <laughs> oh. I, I never saw him smoke in my presence, but... <laughs> But uh, he helped me build uh, some stuff. And my dad didn't have a table saw, but he did. And he would, he would saw some, you know, wood, and all of the shavings would cover all of his black garb. And it blended in very well with his white collar. But um, that was kind of um, a thing I remember uh, about... Uh, the Lutheran and Catholic connection. Nice. Anyone else? Can I can I chip in on, sure. on that as well? Um, Father Major was um, the Catholic pastor from 1945 to 1968, and so he was our longest serving pastor. Um, and um, a couple of years ago, I he came here in 1945 from Helmville. And a couple of years ago, I was uh, visiting the Geary Ranch in Helmville, and they were showing me around the house. And everywhere you looked, up on the up on the wall were um, art pieces. And he said that that was came from Father Major. Apparently, Father Major, all through the years he was here, and since he was in Helmville was a good friend of Madge Gary, who's uh, the grandmother of Bob Gary, who, who lives in the house now in Helmville. And um, so Bob said, I told him, you know, I, I remember Father Major, et cetera, et cetera. And he says, well, do you, do you want one of these? And so he has donated um, to the church one of his, one of his wood carvings. Um, and I don't know if it's necessarily... I, I'm not a connoisseur, but it's a pretty cool representation of what Father Major did. And I had no idea, Lowell, that, that he, was a, he was a woodworker. He was a, an artist. Um, apparently he was. He, um, lots of cabinetry, lots of uh, paintings and, and stuff were, are up at that house now. So, so. I was going to save that for the arts and music section. <laughs> oh, well. <laughs> 
My name is Cliff Iverson, and I grew up here in the community. Uh, did you say there was not a permanent pastor in 1927? Right. Well, permanent in the sense that he served St. Paul and Bonner. But the, I, the I first just, one that resided here. I just dug out my mother's Bible. I think it was her confirmation Bible uh -huh. dated June 1927. She would have been 14 years old. And I, that's one of the reasons I came today, hoping I'd find out who the pastor was. I can tell you that in 27. I'll, I'll look it up. Okay, I'll I'm see not, you after the meeting. Yeah, too. because I... I, d I didn't name all the pastors preceding 49, but the first one that actually lived here, they built a parsonage and, and lived here uh, and was not serving St. Paul as well. I'm assuming this was her confirmation Bible. It says SS, which would be Sunday school. Oh, yeah. But it's yeah. got Our Savior's Lutheran on yeah. it. So. No, it was being served by a pastor. It was just that they didn't have their own pastor apart from a connection with another okay. congregation. Thank you. Uh-huh. Anyone else? This isn't strictly Bonner, but this, this is how the Evangelical Lutheran Church in America came to be. I told you about mergers. Here are all these down here that ultimately worked into this church. I'll lay this here if anybody's interested in seeing it later. I'm I'm sorry. <laughs> that was a misunderstanding. Well, um, we sh I just wanted to let you know that there are two his uh, history books for each of these, um, each of our parishes. Um, ours was written, a Century of Grace, in 2005 on the, on the centennial of St. Anne's. And um, Our Savior's Luther Lutherans was written with Carl's input uh, in, uh, well, it would have been 2008. 2008. Eight, okay. Yeah, for but the hundred. The centennial would have been 2010, is that, or am I? Well, that's the building. The oh, okay. The congregation was organized in, in okay. 08. Gotcha. I'm going to start out by reading a, a short article from the Missoula paper dated June 15th, 1905. New Church for Bonner. Father Filippi stated yesterday that a church would be built at Bonner in the near future. Father Philippi was the, uh, from St. Francis Xavier, which uh, was about 15 years old at that time. He holds monthly services there at present, and owing to the large increase of the attendance and the wishes of the congregation, it was thought advisable to build. The plans have already been drawn by architect Gibson, and the specifications are in the hands of the contractors. It is thought that active operations on the building will commence within a month. They built things fast back then. Nine, that was in June, and I believe in August was the first, um, the first service in, in the first St. Anne Church. Um, the, why, why was it built? Um, Basically, and it's an interesting mixture, a melting pot of, of nationalities, but uh, one large representation back then was the French Canadians. How did the French Canadians get to here? Well, they'd been here since the mill started. Um, a lot of them came from New Brunswick, which was the stomping grounds of a guy named Andrew A.B. Hammond. Um, the Hammond brothers ran this mill for the first 15 or 12 years, I guess, of its, of its existence. And they were not French Canadian. They were Canadian, but right across the line from, from Maine. Um, in fact, Hammond's ancestors were loyalists during the Revolutionary War. And when, uh, when George Washington took Yorktown, a lot of the loyalists fled across the border to to Canada, and in fact, I, if I remember right, the governor of Canada of New Brunswick opened up land for these loyalists, and uh, that's that's where both Hammond's paternal side and maternal side uh, settled right across the St. John River from Maine. That said, he was not. He was not French and he was not Catholic. The Hammonds were not. Um, and I should, should throw in here, while A.B. was the 
the famous one of the Hammond brothers. It was Henry Hammond, his younger brother, I think, who actually ran the mill. And George Hammond, another brother, who was in charge of the woods operations. This was all during the 1880s and 1890s. Um, they're the ones that got their hands dirty. But they did grow up in the logging camps back uh, in New Brunswick and Maine, and they knew that the French Catholics were good rivermen, good, good, uh, good in the woods. And so when the mill began here, that's who, that was the pipeline for a lot of those people who were um, in destitute times back then. So short story long, that's how the Catholics got, got here. Um, it's interesting that over the years now, um, our parish and our diocese here in, in Montana um, uh, has the large Butte Irish Catholic influence. Would you agree, Father Poole? <laughs> we have, um, since we became a, a parish of our own, in 1940, we've had 10 pastors, and five of them came from Butte, and with names like O'Sullivan and Noonan, and one of them came from Anaconda, Father Morley. So um, essentially, we're, we're, we're fed by the Butte Catholics, <laughs> um, the Butte Irish side of the Catholic um, equation. But back then, it was French, and um, most of the masses in the early days were said in Fran France. In fact, I think all of them were in French, um, clear into the 1920s. Um, when, the ch when the church was built in 1905, it was built by St. Saint Francis Xavier, the Jesuit church in Missoula, and they served us on a monthly basis for just the first two or three years. Then we were turned over as St. Francis grew um, we were turned over to Frenchtown, St. John's in Frenchtown, largely because of their connections with the French and the French language. Um, and so from 1908 until 1923, when we were absorbed by the new St. Anthony Parish in Missoula, um, Father Lionel Legree would come out here every month and say Sunday Mass. Question. Yes. I've got a question about your timeline for the building of the church because my folks, my dad and my grandfather, helped build the church. My folks were married in 1920 in Frenchtown at St. John the Baptist. Then I had three older brothers. My youngest was 14 when I was born in 41. They came. They built, they helped build the wooden church that burned in 90 and 66, 67, because I was married there in 64. Okay. And uh, my father always talked about how he, he and my two brothers and his father, we were Sears, helped build the wooden church. They had a building out to the side that's still there, I think, yes. that they used for a church, and it belonged to the school. But the school let us, let the Catholics use that building for a church. And that's the first church. The wooden, wooden church is the second church, and this church is the third one. Exactly, yes. Okay. We and the Lutherans are both on our third church, <laughs> and both of them, both of us, have suffered a fire. Yes. You were talking about Sunday schools or uh, Bible Sunday school or summer schools. The Catholics would have their summer school one week, and the Lutherans would have it the next week, and the kids would go to each. <laughs> I know I did it once or twice. Choose <laughs> more. No, I'm sorry, sir. I should have gotten to you. If, if you want to glance over your shoulders on the back uh, wall right here, we have um, the dedication of the, the second church, which was 1940. Um, and um, they didn't tear down most of the, of the first church. 
and that uh, the 1905 church is is still still stands right next door here and turned towards the school um, my folks had to get married in Frenchtown because that wasn't big enough for a wedding uh, <laughs> they said they had the fit the the weddings in Frenchtown and the funerals in Bonner I don't know why that was <laughs> and the first mill in Milltown was the last mill across the river at the end you know where the old bridge is it was along the riverbank because my grandfather Walters worked there in, in 1886 or? My, they moved here in 1916 my dad was born in 1989 98 and my mother was born in 1900 and my grandfather went to work there and he my grandmother his wife lived in what they call Lothrop she had a bed and breakfast now we call them but it was a boarding house we're going to have to get you a microphone and your name. <laughs> because. <laughs> well, I appreciate that. <laughs> um, we are, we are, this is being filmed and this is a historic recording of events. So the, the information that everybody is sharing, we're hoping, will, uh, will be archived and, and used in later. Yeah. Well, my maiden name is Sear. Okay. <laughs> uh, you got a question? You know, I am here to talk about French and when her family was here and all that. This is Jim Labby, right? Yeah. <laughs> anyway, my uh, grandparents got in Milltown probably in the 1890s sometime. I'm not sure. But I know my dad was born in the old Doucette house February the 14th, 1900. The house that burned down here. My dad was also the way Ann Copenhaver tells me that my dad was best man at her mom and dad's wedding. Uh -huh. <laughs> he was my dad's best man. Your dad. Yeah. Your dad was Ed? Yeah. 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 Okay. Ed Labby. Mm -hmm. uh, Cliff Iverson Cliff. again. The lady just mentioned the uh, Lothrop area. If you have never read the book, there's one out in Lothrop, Montana, and Petty Creek. The western mill over on the other side of the Blackfoot came from Lothrop, Montana. Most of that equipment that was there. My grandfather worked there. Um, I was born in 1933, and he was there prior to that and living in Milltown. So there's a lot of history between Bonner, Milltown, and Lothrop. Okay. And Lothrop was the Western Lumber Company, and the Western Lumber Company, you get back to uh, Senator William Clark, dam, streetcar system, Western Lumber Company um, at Lothrop moved, moved its operations to uh, West Riverside, where Town Pump is now, um, in 1910-1911. So at, at about the time all, all this other thing, stuff was going on in Bonner, we got a second mill just downstream from the first one. Um, I I might divert here just a little bit because we, we keep I keep coming up with W. A. Clark, who was in in some ways the the villain of Montana um, and the senator. But in 1905, the year that this church was built, um, so, uh, William Clark was, among other things, building the dam here in Bonner. He was um, a U.S. Senator, had been since 1901. This time he was elected legitimately, apparently. <laughs> <laughs> so he was doing his Senator thing. He was also in the midst of building the mansion that you may have heard of on 5th Street in 5th Avenue in New York City. I think it was completed a couple of years later, but it was um, it was it was so ostentatious with 141 rooms, a swimming pool, and uh, on and on that um, the the people in New York just laughed at it. <laughs> it was Clark's folly, they called it. But he was building that mansion. He was a senator. He's building the dam, um, and he almost died of a brain tumor that summer. He was in a New York hospital getting operated on. 
Uh, and a couple of months before that, he and his brother were laying out a town site along their railroad in Nevada that was stretching from from uh, Salt Lake City to Los Angeles. The, the, they and a partner were laying out a town site and it was on the a ranch called the Las Vegas Ranch. And uh, that town, of course, became Las Vegas and in Clark County, Nevada. So Clark, Clark had a lot of irons in the fire and, and remained that way uh, until 1925, but he basically was out of Montana after 1907. Legendary Lodge on the Salmon Lake. Right, the the lodge. He had a loft. He had a lookout up on the mountain above it, where they have a cross now, mm -hmm. because he was waiting for the revenuers or watching out for the revenuers. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we really need to get you on the microphone. <laughs> and <laughs> so, um, ledge the it was called the the lodge on, or his cabin, I guess it was on on Salmon Lake um, is now owned by the Catholic Diocese. It's called Legendary Lodge. Um, yeah, a summer camp for, for youth um, that we may get into in our youth category here. <laughs> um, I think I'm gonna leave it at that. I had some more stories about uh, Father Lionel Legree who was um, essentially a character unto himself and he had a car which, which set him apart from most people. Um, John Moe, in, in uh, a little history forum we had here in 2005, remembered Father Legree driving his buggy, basically, his motorized buggy, from Frenchtown at top speed. Sometimes he got it stopped, sometimes he didn't. But he'd pull in to the parking lot here, which was all dirt, or in this case, mud. He'd come in and he'd say Mass. He'd go outside and in the, in the mud, he'd pick up the front end of his car, turn it towards Frenchtown and take, take off back <laughs> to Frenchtown. See, lots, lots of Legree stories. It's uh, Lionel Legree, L-E-G-R-I-S. So. Um, Jim back here. One question for you, Kim. Hold on, we'll get a microphone for you. Well, you can answer this, I think. This is Jim Hobbeck from Jim Hobbeck from uh, First Presbyterian Church, the founding of uh, Norman McLean, and the river runs through it. <laughs> and they'll stop there. But, Kim, you can only answer this question. You, people have mentioned, and I won't mention faces and back, I see the backs of everybody who's talking, um, about getting married and being born. And what's the third part? Dying and being buried. So where is St. Anne's former occupants? Was there any land dedicated any place within a quarter mile of where I'm standing where people are buried? Because they weren't cremating back then, were they? Maybe they did. I don't think the Anaconda Company was into cemeteries. <laughs> I, that's my theory. I mean, the, this, um, it's not a revenue maker. <laughs> so we know we all of, all of our Bonner uh, we've been buried elsewhere uh, and uh, in cl case of the Catholics a lot of them in St. Mary Cemetery in Missoula so I and there's other no, people that know more about that than I do so I um, okay it's time now to turn to the next phase of our thing and this is this is where you guys will really help out o m grimsby was the pastor from 21 to 32 and you said 27 you were looking for his name was o m grimsby and he was at st paul and served out here in bonner as well you're welcome. I've always, when I think about church and church buildings, I always want to say church is not a building, but church is a people. And I remembered a, uh, an old song that 
the kids used to sing about, I am the church, you are the church, we are the church. And I, I couldn't remember one word. The church is not a building. The church is not a steeple. The church is not a something place. The church is a people. And so I went online, and believe it or not, that little song that the kids used to sing was in there. It's amar amazing what you can find on that internet. Um, but it's church is not a resting place, the church is the people. When I was in Post Falls, Idaho, our church burned on uh, New Year's Day, and I remember that so well. And we were thrown into um, a period of time when we had no church building for several months, uh, probably close to six or eight months. And I always look back on that time as the strong time for the church because we didn't have the building to hold us together and we, that we could rely on coming together. We, my office was in a grocery store and we met at one of the schools and, and we met in homes for this and that. And, and I think the people just came together and pulled together in a way that they didn't do when we had our building. Now having said that, uh, I recognize that our buildings are important to us and they're the place that we as congregations call home. Uh, they're the place where the community gathers. So I just want to say something about the buildings that our saviors has had uh, to give you some idea of where we, be, where we have been. And uh, then I don't know, Kim, if you're gonna say something about your buildings <coughs> yet or not, no. but some of you may. Uh, in March, of 1909, uh, the decision was made to build a building for our Savior's Lutheran Church. And the contract was let in 1910 in the spring, and the building was dedicated later that year in October. So from sometime in March to October, this building was put up at the cost of $1,800. That building sat if you look at the present garage of the parsonage, right adjacent to that, in fact, I think the garage shares a wall of foundation with the old foundation for that church building. And it was, it's still there. And through the years, it has been filled with roots and tree trunks and all that. So when I was here, that was all decaying and beginning to sink. Um, and we just kept putting truckload after truckload of fill in that place. And it just kept sinking more every year. Until finally, we decided, you know, we've done the best we could with the fill. We, we planted those, those um, trees. Um, Aspen, thank you. I wanted to say birch, and I know that. We planted aspen so people wouldn't run through that area and, and break their legs because the ground was just so uneven. So that, that our little aspen forest came as a result of that. But that church uh, on land provided by the Anaconda Copper Mining Company. Um, and then on August 27th of 1932, the fire occurred that destroyed that building. Uh, Marie Lean wrote that she was pretty sure that some fellows were drinking and went into the building next door, built upon a fire on the floor, and it spread. Um, I remember her talking at a meeting that Glenn Smith wanted to have. Uh, it was early on when I was here and Glenn was writing an article for the, uh, the newspaper at the mill about the history of the churches. And so we gathered anybody who wanted to come from our congregation and sat one evening and listened to stories, amazing stories that people shared with one another. Uh, and Glenn wrote a wonderful article. I'm sure that's archived someplace on the internet, I'll bet. Yeah, yeah. you could look it up. I, you, do you know where you'd look it up? Not on the internet, but we do have it. History Center. Uh, oh, that yeah. Uh-oh. That uh -oh. We'll that okay, because that, that should be treasured. Uh, but at that meeting, Marie Lean was there, and she could remember, she was quite young at the time of the, 
but she remembers coming with her family because the word got out that the fire was raging and she said and from afar all we could see was the bell in the bell tower glowing red she said it was just unbelievable lit up uh, so that building uh, ended in 1932, but they made a decision to, um, well, let me say a couple other things about that building when I'm there. Somehow they were able to save the furniture, the, the altar, the painting behind the altar and the altar rail uh, through people from the congregation and community people came together and they got that furniture out. And I can remember early on in my ministry, Clara Madsen uh, wanted to re-carpet the kneeling pad on that um, altar rail because it was so important to her. And we had it was now in the basement of the church with the old altar. Uh, so she saw to it that that was recarpeted. And I think it was the Lent right after that, we decided to have our Lenten services in the basement of the church and use that old altar rail and altar. And, and I, I was just amazed watching some of the older people in the congregation for whom those memories were quite vivid with tears in their eyes, uh, kind of re-experiencing this community that had, had come from so long ago. Um, September 21, 1932, they decided to rebuild, uh, not long after the building had been uh, burned. Uh, the price this time was $6,400, a big jump. Uh, it was built on the same foundation that the old one had been built on, and so the walls from that are still to be found over there. Uh, this was during the Depression, and the men were only working one day a week, a lot of them. Uh, so they pitched in and did a lot of hands-on work in this building, uh, and community members too chipped in, and uh, it was a joint effort. Um, There was a lot of support in the community, a lot of support from the mill, and this building uh, was constructed and raised. The, the third building uh, came just as a result of outgrowing the old building, the second building, and ground was broken for that in March of 1965, this time up to $30,000. The church raising, they had a specific day, and uh, on May 2nd of 65, they began to worship in the church on November 7th, and uh, the old building was later moved to Clinton, where it became part of the Clinton Community uh, Clubhouse, and they dedicated the building that exists now in June of 1966. Uh, the addition that to that building uh, began on Pentecost Sunday in 2006. That was my last Sunday uh, by re for, before I retired. And we had a real celebration, and we ended the service by going out and uh, breaking ground for the new building. And then I said, goodbye, <laughs> do a nice job. <laughs> uh, Warren Hampton was uh, serving as the architect for the project, and it was a project that uh, was completed and dedicated two years later on Pentecost Sunday. Uh, so that's where we are with the buildings. I want to mention just something about Hope Baptist, since they're not represented here today, since Dan was called away. Uh, Dan Taylor came to the area in 1991. Uh, he was from Texas, and a lot of the Baptist churches in Texas had uh, kind of an outreach ministry where they'd go and uh, start congregations in other places. They came to this area with the idea of starting 14 Baptist churches in our area, and um, Dan held his first service in uh, 1992. Uh, yeah, I'm going to say this. 
I think poor Dan coming out of Texas, he had no idea what he was getting in for here in Montana. <laughs> he worked so hard going door to door to door to door, meeting people and inviting people and seemingly getting nowhere. I think he just thought the Pacific Northwest was real heathen country <laughs> and that it was almost hopeless. But he persevered and he's still here to this day. Um, they began worshiping with us, at, not with us, but in our building in 1994. And they worshiped on Sunday afternoons. Uh, and then in 1996, they bought property over on Zog Lane. And the, the group from Texas, his folks were still a part of that congregation. They showed up and they had a two or three week building period where they had everything set to go and they used our building as home base and they served their meals and cooked their meals out of our building and then went over and worked over on in West Riverside and they put that building up lickety split and uh, have been there ever since and Dan continues to serve that congregation. So that little bit about, oh, just a couple of things. Art Pine, I know, was very instrumental in in the current building in terms of design and so forth. And my internship uh, congregation in Townsend, Montana, was ultimately arts design. Same design as this, only it was constructed two-thirds size. So I found that connection with me too. Uh, things you want to say about buildings? Yes, Warren. Carl, you didn't mention uh, Reverend Dicey was here during the building of the last church, um, uh, the one that's standing now. He was he was better known as the church builder, you know, from my parents' side of it. Um, but in the early 60s, he was the one uh, serving our congregation that actually got that built. And as I understand it, as soon as it was built, he was on his way to the next project. Okay, okay. Thank you for that. I, I, the reason I'm looking here... You just, oh no, he's listed here. Yeah, he was here from 62 to 66. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Anyone else? Either about the Lutheran Church or the Catholic Church? Buildings. I, I would, uh, in relation to the Catholic Church, I would say um, in when we had our fire in 1985, the 1940 church burned um, in 1985, early 1985, and um, from that time until it, the this church was finished, um, the Lutherans invited us over to their uh, to their church as well. So, just like Hope Baptist spent two years um, with holding services there, we we spent almost two years, a year and a half for sure. Um, Saturday afternoon or Saturday evening and Sunday morning services um, f uh, thanks to the Lutherans opening their doors so okay Kim there are a lot of people here that remember those days um, I, I think Shirley Couplin was on the building committee or at least the parish council um, there's a, there's yeah any number of people here, I won't try to <laughs> identify them all. Well, Joe, yes, Joe. Joe Labby was uh, instrumental in getting us a new church as well. So. Do it, do. I don't. I don't have anything else exactly exactly on the buildings, but uh, is there? Does it stir up any stories, um, either the fires or or the old churches? Ken. Hi. Um, Ken Pierce. <coughs> I was a volunteer fire. I was a volunteer fireman at the time, and uh, I always remember the, the coming in here and seeing that building poured in walls. And uh, I was just looking at the picture there on the corner of the old uh, of the church, and uh, the, the front window front window was where you go into the front of the parish was was gone. And I sat with another guy and we poured water over a three-inch line for four or two hours in there trying to put that fire off. 
it was kind of a sad day. Is that is that turned on? <laughs> <laughs> one, of my, one of my memories of the 1940 church, um, it had this beautiful hall downstairs. Um, I've included some pictures here with the knotty pine paneling, etc. That stirs up a lot of memories, and the, even this, you can still smell it <laughs> in a way. Um, I graduated from Bonner School in eighth grade in 1970, and for whatever reason, the superintendent, Leo Musburger at that time, didn't let us have school dances at the school. And so our eighth grade graduation dance, Hey Jude and all the House <laughs> of the Rising Sun, that was downstairs in this, in this church before it, before it burnt down. So. And a lot of people got married here. A lot of people in this crowd got married in that church. So, Bev. Uh, I, uh, I brought a picture of uh, the last. Hold on just a second. <laughs> uh, I brought a picture of uh, the last mass, a uh, Christmas mass that we had in our old church. And I don't know if you have a picture of that, but I would certainly like to dedicate it or give it. If, um, if you don't have one, uh, Father Tom. Gannon was the priest then, and I remember we all wondered, oh, where is Father Gannon? And he just happened to have been gone that night, so he wasn't here when that... Uh, he was at a funeral in Butte. He was at a funeral in Butte. Yeah. So that was wonderful. And I just want to give my thanks to the Lutheran Church also for um, opening up their doors and so gracious with hospitality. Um, inviting us over there for those two years, um, which we also had our CCD down in the basement. And so we used the whole church, truthfully, and I just want to tell you how much we appreciated that. Mm -hmm. There are some pictures of here of... What caused the fires? Pardon? What caused the fires? Um... <laughs> The, the, the official word in the paper, at least, was there was wiring in the ceiling of the basement right in the altar area of the, of the 1985 fire. But, Ann, did you? It was in the furnace. There was some wiring got okay. It didn't burn the whole thing down. They saved the pews, and right. they had them refinished, and those are the ones in there. And they were donated originally from St. Anthony's when they got new ones. Oh, from St. Anthony's, the pews were. Um, a, lot, a lot of the stained glass windows were, um, well, not a lot of them, but some of them were destroyed, but some of them were um, charred. I mean, there, there was almost unrecognizable. And so a few years ago, the ones, they were, we, were, we kept them, and they were... Um, refurbished, I guess you'd call it, by, by Tom Connolly, um, who unfortunately has died since then. But um, they, uh, there's four of them right behind us uh, in the back there on display, a couple more in through the door there at the con in the confessional. Mm -hmm. And I was just going to read quickly the, the names. These were dedicated in the 1940 church. Mm -hmm. So Mr. and Mrs. Tom Fleming, um, the Susie family, Mr. and Mrs. Clifford LaForge, I think, is the third one there. And uh, the fourth one is in memory of Gladys Shannon. Um, lots of stories about those names, those families, but we won't get into those <laughs> right now. Mr. Habeck. I know there's a Pittsville rural Pilt fire Piltsville. department right now as we sit here. The question that I have is, was there a period of decades or even a half a century when any fire in this region where the two rivers come together depended on responses from Missoula? No wonder they could have been 30 minutes away from the first truck coming on. I'm going to say no. We had the Anaconda Company. No. The Anaconda, they were the fire department? Yes. 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 They had the fire truck. They had their own They had a bumper, but... It only Can. had like 500 gallons of water, so Can. it didn't go very far. Say that again. <laughs> I'm going to do that again. Okay. But say, say your name.
This is Ken Pierce. Yes, uh, it, it was the Anaconda Company. They had a, an, a pumper that they would run out to the community, but it was, had, like I say, a 500-gallon tank on it, and that didn't go very far when you had a fire. But when you dialed 911, what happened? There was no 911. <laughs> <laughs> that, that was Cliff's phone number. <laughs> you know, uh, well, ta talking about fires and all that, it was probably in the mid 1950s. There was a uh, grass fire start over here where the old Anaconda Dep was. It burned down two or three houses over there, as I remember. And the Missoula Fire Department brought a water tender out and a couple of fire trucks. I mean, they were. Remember, they were hooked up to the hydrants there in Milltown, and I know they were on that fire. There is talk of one of these roundtables next year being on the fires of, Mon of Bonner or even the crimes of Bonner. Um, so, uh, lots of good stories. <laughs> um, I think we better move on. Well, well, the, extension of my, the extension of my thought was whether the residents themselves were volunteer firemen. Very much so. There's stories in our history book of the Finnish women <laughs> manned the pumps on fires. They were, uh, they were um, very much involved in any fire that popped, you know, in Milltown. I, I think we're talking different eras here. Um, the Anaconda Company was the main um, founder of the BFPA, the Blackfoot Fire Protective Agency Association that fought the forest fires around here for, I don't know, 70 years until the state took over. Cliff Iverson again. 1946, the school caught fire and the company sent men and equipment out there. Mrs. Dufre and I was in the seventh grade and she saw Tony Petroff coming through the weeds. He wasn't very tall, but she saw him coming and knew there was a problem. In regards to the one that Jim Labby talked about, there was an older Norwegian gentleman by the name of, well, Nils Abramson, but they called him Big Nils. He was probably six foot four or something like that, but took out several. I think, Rick, didn't your folks live at the end of that uh, area there? We're going to speed up things up here. We're probably running over time here, and we still got a couple little categories we want to wanna, wanna hit, I think, unless everybody's ready for pasties. <laughs> um, I, we did want to talk a little bit about the youth and children in our churches in Bonner. And um, I, I, I just a little anecdote. I'm going to read it, actually. Uh, that, again, this was from John Moe, who um, the former sheriff of Missoula County, I think most of you recognize the name. Um, he grew up here. He was... Uh, he was around when, when Father Legree was serving us. And um, he said, among other things, he helped his, his grandfather, Vital Sir? Vital Sir. V I T A L E. Sir. V I T A L. V I T A L. Okay. It's on a window in there. It's one of those windows that are, that are dedicated, yes. Um, he stoked the fire before mass before Father Legree got here in the in the night this would have been in the 1920s um, he said I was an altar boy and of course the mass was in Latin so once we got rid of the French <laughs> we didn't we didn't go to English we went to Latin un until Vatican II in the 60s but and I remember my greatest desire was to ring the bell so we'd ring the bell and dominant us Vobiscum or something like that as an altar boy. Otherwise, I didn't understand what was going on, and neither did anybody else. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so, uh, questions, anything in that, you know, as youths, which we all were at one time, um, in relation to, the, to any of the churches in, in Bonner? Um, we had lots of youth groups, lots of that kind of thing. My name is Jennifer Alexander, and I remember when the church burned, and Mom got the phone call, 
and I, I very vividly remember her getting the phone call, and then after that, I remember going over to our saviors and CCD in the basement. I went down there recently, and it's so small. <laughs> but back then, it was so big. We had vacation Bible school over there, um, a lot of things. And then I was one of the uh, first communion students in the first church. We had the first, well, in this church, we had the first first communion class. And uh, that was pretty fun. And going to Legendary Lodge all those years a lot of times from help with this parish. And um, my daughter was baptized here. I was baptized here. My sisters and brother were baptized here. And my mom was married here. So I don't know, a lot of, a lot of history. Can we identify your mom? <laughs> Tony LaBelle. The LaBelle family moved here when US plywood uh, came in, early 70s. Okay, um, I'm Charlotte Hampton. Um, I was in the uh, first uh, uh, member of the first confirmation class at Our Saviors in the new building, and my brother Warren was a member of the last <laughs> confirmation class in the old building. Um, and uh, we have really good memories growing up of Pastor Anderson coming to our house uh, to visit our grandmother who lived with us and <laughs> he never really called first <laughs> and, <laughs> and he always came for tea and I just remember mother always in a flurry <laughs> because oh no it's Pastor Anderson <laughs> we got it <laughs> making us look a little bit better um, but as a you asked about memories as a youth growing up um, <coughs> uh, none of us kids really like to drink um, church Kool-Aid, <laughs> it always smelled funny, you know, it's just like, oh no, it just smelled funny, and then years later, you know, I was long gone from this area, but uh, we learned about the contamination uh, in the wells, and then um, the arsenic, and then, you know, we had all these, um, like the men would always do Easter breakfast, and I just remember all of us running up and down the stairs in the old church. And, uh, and then there was this one, one of Lefty Pleasant's boys. He threw up at every church <laughs> meal. You could just count on that kid. <laughs> Lefty, are you here? <laughs> We probably better, we're running over time already, and we wanted to s say a little little about the arts and music category. Um, so if we could move on to that. There's so much more on the youth that we could talk about, but unfortunately. I'll be brief. Uh, arts and music play such a huge role, I think, in, in the church. Uh, the Lutherans have often been called the singing church, and we do love to sing, and as Garrison Keeler always reminds us, we love to sing in harmony, and uh, we love things that help us understand our faith a little better, and art has a, a way of doing that. In a smaller congregation, I think a lot of times we have to make our own art and make our own music, uh, because we can't afford to do you know, hire someone out to do that. So I think a lot of us in smaller congregations do that. I just want to tell uh, one story about the uh, a Lent that we did here. We decided we were going to center our theme around the cross, and we invited everybody from the congregation to bring in crosses that they might have hanging in their homes, because a lot of people do that, or a piece of jewelry or something, and we hung it all around the sanctuary. And it was quite splendid to have all of these different things, and people would look at those and say, oh, that's mine, or, or see what other people had brought. Then that same year, I uh, asked Norman Jacobson about the possibility of doing 
if you don't know Norman Jacobson's photography, you're missing something. He's an amazing, amazing man and talented and creative. So months ahead of time, he started taking pictures of crosses around the community. And we had picked a different theme for each uh, Wednesday night during Lent. And he took pictures of crosses that fit that theme. And it was absolutely amazing when we came together and he took lots of pictures. Do you remember how many? It, it was hundreds. Yeah. But it, it was just an amazing way to center our thoughts. Uh, and then the other thing we did that year in terms of this cross theme, I, I can't remember for sure who made it, but someone fashioned a huge cross out of uh, telephone poles and put it together and it was heavy and we had it laying on the floor in the center of the building uh, and we kind of gathered around it for worship and <laughs> that was that year then the next year we weren't going to use it inside but I remember uh, we thought oh it'd be nice to have by the front door as people come in and I remember carting that thing around on my shoulder I thought if people ever see this they're going to think the crucifixions happening all over again. <laughs> it weighed a ton but I had to drag it around the building to the front door so that was you know homemade art and I think homemade art serves us well I uh, sometimes in in terms of music there's a story I want to tell too uh, sometimes we would bring in people to uh, perform or to to lead worship and so forth although we had a lot of talented people in the congregation one year it was in 93 or 4 uh, there was a German choir coming through and they asked about the possibility I don't know how we hooked up with them but they asked about the possibility of our hosting a concert in the building and so we agreed that we would uh, host this concert and they came, there were 35 of them or something, and they were really wonderful, well-trained musicians. And, and uh, we, <laughs> we held their concert at, I don't know, 7, 7.30, and Carl hadn't thought to find out about, uh, you know, the train that used to come <laughs> back and forth. And, and the parsonage, you know, it seemed like it was that far from the train track. So when it came, it rattled. And the, the church as well. Well, they sang their concert, and all of a sudden, they began to sing a song called, an old spiritual called, I Hear the Train a Coming. <laughs> <laughs> and I heard the train a coming off in the distance and it came and it came and louder and louder until finally they had to quit singing because it so we just we just stood there and waited for the train to get through it it's loading and unloading and then they picked up and continued their concert so uh, you may have stories that deal with art and music and you're welcome to share them but that's all I'm going to say in the interest of time Anybody? They heard the word pasty. <laughs> <laughs> Anybody want to make any closing remarks on any of these areas about the church as kind of the center of our community, the church and the school and the, the mill? Yes? I remember one time I read an article in the Missoulian and it said, Bonner, everything was Bonner, 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 and I'm going, huh. I thought West Riverside was where the convenience store is. Bonner is when you cross the, or Milltown is where you cross the bridge. When you go across the railroad track, you're in Bonner. When you go the railroad track the other way, you're in Piltsville. So I called him up and I told him, I said, you guys got to look on a map. Bonner isn't all this out here. <laughs> Yes, Thank we you have know more communities squeezed in here than... You don't know how many times that comes up as a point of conversation in the news media around <laughs> <on> Missoula. <laughs> yes? I'm, I'm Bob Fister from over here for the last eight years or so. We uh, Thank you so much for putting this on. We really appreciate it. 
Uh, some of the older members of our congregation, when they get going, like Lois Johnson here, she has told me the stories of the Luther League and how great an organization they had going at that time. I encourage each of you in your own churches here to schedule time with your own congregation to get your elder members of the church to share memories with the whole church. I think it'd be a neat thing to do in your individual churches. But thank you very much for putting this on today.